So this, uh, this uh, patient goes to an emergency department closer to home. And Mr. So is an unfortunate 58-year-old guy who's brought in today due to intoxication and a fall. Slipped on ice, he's Minnesota. Um, he hit his head on a pole, no loss of consciousness, unsteady, so, so he's drunk. That's, that's the short story of that. He has a CT of the head that's negative, and he's getting ready to be discharged. I mean, we cleared him, everything is fine. Then he becomes unresponsive, hypotensive, and bradycardic, and troponins are borderline positive. So obviously, the emergency department senses this is perhaps a little more than just a drunk person falling on ice. How about we send him uh, to, to Mayo Clinic, where he's transferred? He goes straight to the CCU because the floor uh, team feels uncomfortable dealing with somebody who, who has potentially problems, and that's his electrocardiogram. So if you look at that carefully, it's not a lot, but maybe a little ST segment depression in the lateral leads, but that's about as far as it goes. If you want, you can get off ST elevation in the inferior leads. It doesn't meet the one millimeter criteria. Nish keeps telling us it doesn't have to really be one millimeter. You know, just keep that in mind. I have to say I'm a little bit nervous because I was on CCU over Christmas. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. So, so, so he's awake, he has a chest now, the next day, when he's awake, now he can actually tell you a little more about himself, you know? So he says, geez, I have had these on and off chest pains for maybe seven to 10 days. It's a bit of a problem. Gets the ECG. The troponin, it's borderline positive and goes a little higher than that. So then it's a lot of discussion. Should we, shouldn't we, should we, shouldn't we? We should. Just, just do the cat. You'll know. You'll be happy with that. So that's the coronary angiogram. So not much on the left side, but if you look on the right side, you can appreciate a filling defect at the ostium of the right coronary artery. So it's felt that there's probably a thrombus in there, so he undergoes thrombectomy of the proximal RCA, and obviously started on clopidogrel, on heparin bridging uh, to, to warfarin. And next day we have the echocardiogram, because now we had somebody who did infarct, so normal or abnormal. All right. So, so, bicuspid, maybe? I don't know. No, nobody, nobody <laughs> is taking the bicuspid on this one. But obviously, clear-cut abnormality. So, so there's a large mass in the right um, coronary um, cusp. Uh, and the question is, what have we got? And I promised you the CT, so I'm going to stick by that. It's my, my poor imitation of Nandan, what Nandan is trying to do. But you can see here, again, the large mass in the right coronary sinus, large mass in the coronary sinus, and then it gets awfully close to the ostium of the right coronary artery where we just did the catheterization and, and aspiration of the mass. So because of that, obviously he has a TE, so we get this, big something hanging on the right coronary, you can see very, very nicely the right coronary artery there. We can show it to you in 3D, it doesn't add much, but it looks really cool, so, so I, I thought I'll show it to you. So what do you want to do? Culture, empirical antibiotics, this is a mass. Huh? Uh, consult CV surgery, continue anticoagulation, or it's the day after Christmas, so you can do option four, return the, the sweater, okay? All right, what, so let's what, vote on that. Uh, Hey, CV surgery, it's a good thought. Buzz. Was, was the material that was removed in the thrombectomy sent for pathologic? Not, you, cannot, you know the problem working with these guys, it's hard to, to get things past them. So yes, the, the material has been sent to the lab and the lab sends back that actually, uh, this is actually thrombus, that's what they say. But then he, uh, he gets into this discussion, should he, shouldn't he, should he, shouldn't he go to the OR. He is not really excited to go to the OR. So surgery is offered to the guy, but, but then uh, a little reluctance. Um, the point is, he does not really respond to heparin for the last three days. Remember, he came on the 23rd, 24th, we had the diagnosis, so he got started on heparin at that time. 
So then you start thinking, gosh, is this more complex? And now, because he's completely awake, and because he, he starts saying, gee, maybe I had a little, I wasn't able to move my, my leg all that fine, and maybe I was a tad dizzy when, when I fell on ice, even if I was drunk, and that could explain. So he gets this. And this is the comprehensive note from the, from the uh, primary team. Uh, it's a very good cardiologist, actually. So the discussion is going along these lines. There was a thrombus, we know that, that associated with the mass. Because this is, after all, a mass. Could that be a papillary fibrolastoma? Uh, should we think about non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis? Should we think of uh, hypercoagulability workup? That was actually unrevealing. Um, but he's not responding to anticoagulation. So what do you do? Tissue. Hmm? You need tissue. More tissue. All right. So Heidi tries to, to twist this guy's arm to, to go to surgery. So here is what comes out. Vascular and, and the rheumatology consult, really, it doesn't look like this is hypercoagulable state. So, so he has a mildly positive um, um, uh, um, uh, marker, but all the rest, it's negative. So they say, well, this is reactive. We, we don't worry about that. There's no connective tissue disease. He did actually have a stroke. So this poor guy who fell on ice, well, uh, he did have a cerebellar stroke. So, so there's uh, evidence on that on MRI. It's super cute, so it's brand new. Scheduled for surgery. So he's ready to go into surgery, but still doesn't want surgery. So surgery says, fine, if you really don't want to do that, we'll repeat the TTE. TTE shows a little less mass. And then the plan is, okay, we'll wait until January 2nd to operate. All right. Normal or abnormal ECG? I'd say maybe a tad abnormal. So a so couple of things, right? So, so it's the, the STT changes. And if you look carefully, you see that he is in complete AV block. Huh? So, so complete AV block there. He's diaphoretic, hypotensive. So he goes to the cat lab where he has that. So now the question is, do you do surgery acutely? Of course, the, the problem is getting him to the OR in time that he doesn't die in the process because he's hypotensive, severe, severely hypotensive. He's going into shock. And the decision is made, okay, let's try to do the thrombus aspiration. They do that. They have to balloon all over the place, and this is the end result. So he still has an embolus in the, in the uh, PDA. So it's part of the problem, and this is the way it is. And then he gets an echo next day because he just had an intervention. And you can appreciate now the mass is much smaller. So, so I guess there's one way to, to, to decrease the, the size of the mass. If you embolize a lot of that, it's not going to be there. Huh? So, so that worked for him. Fortunately, he has only minor inferior wall motion abnormalities, and he has an EF that's still preserved, and cardiac output is preserved. So, so he lived uh, to, to, to survive that, which is good. So, Dr. Schaff actually is the, the one who saw, saw him on January 1st, and he said, still, you still need surgery. You still have a mass. You still have the potential to have that mass go wherever you want in your body, and he still declines. So this is the follow-up. January, it's still 0.5, 0.5. January 4th, 0.5, 0.5. February, 0.5. Three and one year later, finally one year later, he has complete resolution on, of the mass uh, with anticoagulation alone. So he, he chose his way, and it turns out in the end he avoided surgery, but, but I would say it made everybody feel very, very nervous about that. He can still move all sides of his body? Yep, yep. He, he, he's still able to, to lift that thing to his mouth, you know. So, so we consider that a Christmas present, the next Christmas, though. Now, this is very rare. As, uh, as Dr. Schaff pointed to me just a couple of weeks ago, and I was trying to convince him there's a thrombus on the valve, um, there's, this is very rare. This is unusual uh, situation. And this is by Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Alan Klein is the senior author. So you can imagine if they don't have a series and they have to pull the literature to do something, it means this is not really common. So they were able to, to pick up 74 cases in the literature. And recurrent embolism is frequent in this case series. So this is nobody else's unique experience. 
Uh, if you look at etiologies, uh, presentations, hypercoagulable and valve disease, these are all for, for you in the syllabus, just, just to think about that. But these are the common offenders. And really, the management for that, it's, it's challenging. Now, I would say this. Um, if you look at valve thrombosis, that is an artificial valve. So the bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. The question I, I keep getting many times is, how long does it take for anticoagulation to work? And this guy took one year. Uh, could this be something that you will experience with the bioprosthetic valves too? And we looked at that, and it turns out that if you look at six months, only about 50% of the aortic valves will have responded in full uh, to anticoagulation. So, so it takes a long time for anticoagulation to work in artificial valves. Whether that's the same case for native valve thrombosis, God knows. It's just not enough cases there to, to, to make a decision on that. So what are the take-home points? Very unusual presentation with native valve thrombosis can exist. There's a high risk of embolism based on the existing literature. Anticoagulation may take a long time. And at Christmas, just beware of the Grinch, okay?